This is what happens when you redline it and finish it strong. Try bodybuilding. I'm telling you, it's all about breaking the myths, man. Debunking the myths about you can't put a size being a cardio machine. I just redline this piece, man. So, we'll see how we do. Good relay. Got a relay going today. It's going to be tight. There's a tri bodybuilder right there. Big tri bodybuilder. Good job, bro. Crush the bike, man. Good yeah. Take a left and uh, Good. get on out for the next run stage. Alright, this guy should be coming. Just ridiculous, man. You can see your abs through your shirt. Pro Louisiana starts today, man. It's a good machine, huh? Exhale, more. 12, let's go. Yeah, 13, exhale, no air. 14, there you go. Yeah, 15, there it is. Now do a front raise, two arms, front shoulder raise. Hey guys, thanks for watching, Yvonne Blasco is here. Um, we're making this video because um, there's a lot of um, just grand opportunity here. Uh, first off, I'm going to uh, list the studies at the bottom of this video. And, um, you know, me and my friend Evan, our, uh, our group on Facebook, Try Bodybuilding, is basically, it's concurrent training. It's doing aerobic exercise with weight training. So let me just dive right into the studies. First off, there's this interesting study. It's called Concurrent Exercise Training Do Opposites Distract. I love that. That's a catchy title. Let me just read what it says. The conclusion is that there's chronic, chronic training studies provide robust evidence that endurance exercise can attenuate muscle hypertrophy and strength, but the, mechanis, the mechanistic underpinning of this interference effect is unknown. So in other words, it's saying there's a lot of there's strong evidence that endurance exercise can, can minimize or mitigate enlargement of muscle and strength. Well. I came across this, uh, this study here, a new study from uh, Dr. Marak. In fact, I just finished watching his video on YouTube and I actually uh, uh, commented and I, I actually attached a video of Try Bodybuilding. Um, he actually believes the opposite. In fact, this was a, he, is, he actually did a, uh, a very, uh, uh, his paper is called Skeletal muscle hypertrophy with concurrent exercise training, contrary evidence for an interference effect. I love that. Um, and he talks about how there's actually studies that show that there's no interference. And he also provides evidence that there are studies show that aerobic training can actually alone by itself. So if you take an untrained person and you get them to do aerobic training, like per, let's say on the bike, right? Because cycling tends to be one of the more anabolic uh, aerobic activities, but you know, any, any aerobic activity can be anabolic. I appreciate that. I haven't done anything yet. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate you all coming out. Uh, so the title of my talk is Concurrent Exercise Training and Muscle Hypertrophy. And so uh, I'll jump right in here in a sec, but this is a topic that's sort of near and dear to me for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of which is I like to exercise, I always have. And I've always kind of trained concurrently. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more what that means. So I have a personal interest in it, but also my research interest has aligned with this as well. And so my head's kind of been here for a little while. And um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to come here and talk to you about this because I think what I'm going to talk about today is uh, perhaps a little bit of a paradigm shift in some respects. And so hopefully uh, you guys will find it interesting and won't call my bluff, but maybe you will. And that's great too. We can talk about that. <laughs> Really where this kind of began in the literature though, was uh, with this one study by Robert Hickson in 1980. So uh, he conducted a study where he wanted to kind of look at the, the effects of combining two different modes of exercise and what that actually does for adaptation in each individual mode. And so he designed this really elegant study, and this study has been cited 
I think I checked the other day, 580 some odd times, almost 600 times. Pretty much any study that has ever talked about concurrent exercise training, the first paragraph or the first line of the paragraph is, Robert Hickson in 1980 said blah, blah, blah. And then they go on to talk about you know, whatever the study's about. But it always begins here. Because in the literature, this was like the genesis of the idea that you should not combine training modes to maximize growth. So, but then we look at this, this is the strength adaptations, right? So on the, um, the y-axis here, we have how much strength they gained throughout the, uh, the 10 weeks of training. And this top line here is just the strength training group, right? So over the entire duration of the 10 week study, their strength just went up and up and up. They just kept gaining, which is great. That's what you wanna see. This line right here is the strength and endurance or the concurrent exercise training group. What they found is that at this first interval here, about the first seven weeks, their strength went up and up and up as well. And you'll know that they started in different places, but the slope of the line is more or less the same. So they had similar gains when they did concurrent exercise training up to about seven weeks, at which point strength actually started tailing off and going down. And so it was from this study, this original finding, really this figure right here, this seminal figure, where people started saying, okay, you can combine training when you're endurance training, no worries. But if you're trying to maximize your strength training adaptations, you should not include endurance training with your resistance training. That's, this figure is where it came from, really. And um, in the endurance training group, they weren't really gaining strength. That kind of makes sense. They weren't doing strength training. And so, um, so that's where this idea came from. But the thing is, though, every time the study is cited, I would have to say probably 50% of the time it's not cited correctly. Because usually this study is cited within the context of hypertrophy. Naturally, when you resistance train, one of the main goals of resistance training is to gain muscle mass, correct? You want to get bigger and you want to get stronger. And the strength and the size kind of go hand in hand in some capacity. But this always gets cited as if you want to gain mass, don't do endurance exercise. Cite the Hickson study. And it doesn't show that. They didn't actually do a whole muscle measure like with an MRI or anything. It's just the strength went down. And in fact, the one size measure that they did, which is a very crude measure of muscle size, didn't show any different. They basically did leg circumference and the strength group and the strength and endurance group had the identical gain in leg size from a leg circumference perspective. And so, and like nobody ever talks about that. That's like buried in the paper, but nobody notices it and nobody cites it either. But it's there, it's the data's in the paper. And it kind of got me thinking like, why? why? Why has this become so pervasive? Why have people kept saying that you can't do these things when this original paper doesn't even show that, per se? Sure, the fact that strength goes, when goes down at the end, that might translate to less gains down the road, but honestly, look at the training. I would bet that they were just overtrained and they were just tired you know, by the end of this, and they just didn't want to lift anymore. And so, um, so yeah. So this idea is where it came from, but the paper is usually miscited within the context of concurrent training and muscle size. I guess the question now becomes, can endurance training in and of itself cause muscle growth? Which is a really interesting question. And there's actually been a lot of studies that have shown endurance training by itself without resistance training causes pretty significant muscle growth, at least in untrained people. So on the y-axis, we have the size of the quadriceps, which is your thigh muscle here. And um, on the x-axis, I have a couple different studies that I dug up from the literature. And you'll see that with three days a week of cycling over 10 weeks, you could grow your muscle by as little as 3%, but if you cycle train for 12 weeks, or even for a shorter time, six weeks, you can have muscle growth in your thighs of as high as 7%, which is like almost as much as you would get with resistance exercise alone over that time frame. And so it's actually interesting in the literature, endurance training by itself can be hypertrophic. So it's kind of confusing, like why, why is this idea that if you combine endurance and resistance training together bad for growth, when endurance training just by itself clearly causes growth? And so that really got us thinking about what does the literature really say about concurrent training? Like, is this a real thing? Is it true that you can, you, if you combine aerobic and resistance exercise that you blunt growth? Is that a real thing? Because I don't buy it. If the endurance training by itself causes growth, I don't buy it. And so. Jimmy and I then went through the literature and uh, more or less found every study that has ever looked at whole muscle growth with concurrent exercise training. And so I talked about the Hickson study already that gets cited all the time as like, 
you can't grow if you have aerobic and resistance training together. I really wanted to know the answer. So we went and found every study that ever looked at this. And every study that looked at this, um, I had to make sure that they had enough subjects. So we, all these studies have at least eight people in, this, in, this, in the groups. And we also wanted to look at muscle size and make sure it was an accurate measure of muscle size. So all the studies that I'm about to show you, they measured muscle size either by MRI or by CT scan, which is highly accurate. We're not talking about you know, doing leg circumference or anything like that. We're talking about highly sensitive measures of muscle size, okay? And so on the y-axis here, we again have quadriceps hypertrophy. So we have uh, muscle growth of the thigh, which those are the muscles you're exercising. If you're doing leg strengthening and if you're doing cycling, that's the muscle that's getting hit. So if there is going to be interference, it'll be in your quadriceps, right? And so we have quadriceps growth on the y-axis, and we have all the different studies that we were able to dig up on the x-axis, okay? And we, um, we titrated it out by how much time was in between the exercise bout, so in between the aerobic exercise and the resistance exercise throughout the training. Because the, the idea is if we're going to have an interference effect, if these two aer aerobic and resistance exercise modes are going to have a negative effect on one another, it's probably going to happen when you're doing them really close in proximity, when there's no time to recover, right? And so we titrated out by how much time is in between the two modes throughout the course of the training. And so this is what we found. <coughs> Basically, uh, with concurrent exercise training, not a single study in close proximity concurrent exercise training has shown blunted growth of a hypertrophy. Not a single study we could find. In fact, one study showed significantly more growth when you combine aerobic and resistance exercise training together. So that was kind of baffling. It's like, okay. I was like, surely there are some studies out there where there's actually shown blunted growth with concurrent training. The answer is no. And if it's out there, I haven't seen it, and I'll probably be the one to find it. And so if you're aware of a study, please tell me about it, because I, I haven't seen it. And so, um, so that was interesting. And then if you divide, or if you space out the aerobic and resistance exercise within the training program by six hours or more, so let's say you come in, you aerobic train one day, and then the next day you resistance train, it's almost unanimously more growth with concurrent training. So the whole idea that muscle growth, or that aerobic training and resistance training are not complementary for muscle growth, there's no evidence, at least in the literature, from a whole muscle perspective, if I'm measuring your whole thigh, there's, there's no evidence for it. And we've been talking about this and we've been saying that this is what's happening since 1980. And so we just published a study in uh, sports medicine. It's available online. I'm sure if you want it, Jimmy will give it to you. But um, yeah, so that really, uh, that really got us thinking about this differently. And so that was exciting though for us. And, uh, it just, it just kind of goes to show, though, that it's really easy to ascribe something to a single study. And you really need to look at the global perspective. You need to look at all the literature. You need to read as much as you can to really understand what's happening. Because most people, even now, when you ask them, they'll say, don't do the two together. But it seems that within at least the parameters of these studies, it kind of seems OK. It's a complex, um, you know, science, but I definitely side with Dr. Maroc a lot more, and I have my own. If I was to make a paper, I would call it concurrent exercise training. Do opposites interact? So not distract. Do they interact? Now, could they distract? Technically, yes. It could distract strength, and it's it's a said pr principle: specific adaptations to impose demand. So if you have a uh, a power lifter who really is focused on that, they could still probably do, I mean, kind of to be conservative, they may just not do any endurance exercise and they'd probably be just fine. Okay? But for a larger, a larger demographic, the general public, the people who really kind of need to focus on getting leaner and stronger and just kind of healthy, healthy, you know, lifestyle and healthy aging, uh, concurrent training is ideal. So, we're spinning a topic in a negative way because it may interfere with the progress or success of a very small percentage of the population, powerlifters and advanced uh, strength athletes. Really? You see what I mean? That's the problem.
a part of studies that is always looked at is the population group. Is it what, what population are we looking at? And do the findings, are, you, are they relevant to that population? Probably 95, 90 to 95% of, of the population, the general population, they don't care about whether they're losing one to 2%, that they're getting a small percent less of muscle gain. You know, I talk about the systemic signal of anabolic versus catabolic, and I believe that we need a mixed signal. Um, that's why there is the anecdotal claim of when uh, uh, people, when they just lift weights to try and lose weight, or to try and burn fat, they'll sometimes get bigger, they'll bulk up. Well, the problem is you're not losing fat fast enough and you're building muscle. So what happens is you're not losing as much fat, but you're building muscle and you end up looking bigger and you actually are a little bigger. If you do a cardio while you strength train and you can manipulate that balance of a ratio of, of those two uh, training methods, now you have a little bit of a mixed signal, but you can coax that signal either way. If you want to get a little more catabolic, if, if you're a woman and you're, you're, you're afraid of potentially bulking up, you do more cardio, you do a little less weights. So now weight training becomes more of a muscle preservation rather than a muscle build generation technique. If you're a guy and you want to get bigger, you do less cardio, but maybe you do a little hit so you can get the heart health benefits and a lot of that, that in fact, there's studies that show that hit is highly anabolic. Okay, you, you know, cardio could be three sets of 20 seconds on, on a bike, hitting it really hard on a sprint, and then the rest of your workout is weight, so you can do that on the back end. So there's no excuse to think that we, we need to stop doing one for the other. We're in, we're in a modern day society and a modern science, and this is 2016, and now we understand that both of them are gonna be better. Um, I think that's old school um, rhetoric, uh, talking about you know, strength training uh, or cardio interfering with strength training, again, that's gonna be a very small percentage of the population, and that's not helping you. It's not helping most people, okay? Most people simply wanna get fitter, leaner, and stronger. If you follow my method, concurrent training, if you follow what uh, Dr. Mar uh, Maraca, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, if not, I apologize. If you follow what we're, what we're saying, um, you can add significant size, but the difference is, you're gonna be lean and mean. You're gonna have a good ratio of muscle to fat. You're not just gonna have a lot of muscle with a lot of fat too. Um, so again, I'm gonna just wrap it up. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions and, co and comments below, but uh, you, sh you should join our group, Try Bodybuilding. That's what we're about, concurrent training, folks. Um, concurrent training has been shown to be highly effective for fat loss, especially abdominal uh, fat loss. And, uh, and they both complement each other. So they don't necessarily distract. Maybe for like the very, very minority of the population, they'll distract. For those who are specifically training for like uh, an extreme uh, event or sport, yes, perhaps, possibly, of course, there's evidence to suggest that's possible. But for the majority of the population, you're gonna optimize your results. You're gonna optimize, right? So anyhow, that's all I want to say about this topic and uh, stay tuned for future videos, but uh, thanks for watching. It was a great day, man. Triathlons are really good and they're really fun. So.